this morning, uh, we are going to start in Psalm 57. So you can turn there. We'll get there in just a moment. Uh, and uh, we'll title, just so you know where we're going, we'll call Psalm 57 a song in the wilderness. All right? A song in the wilderness. And where I want to begin is by making a confession to you as a, as a pastor, make a confession, and then I want to make a promise. And the confession is this. Did anybody get nervous right away when I said confession? Don't worry. Uh, this is my confession, is that there are a lot of curious lines in the Bible. Yes? I confess that. That I, things that I don't really understand. Do you, does anybody, is, am I amongst friends? There's, there's things in the Bible where you read them and you go, I still really don't know what that's about. I, I think I understand, but I maybe don't. And there are statements that we, come, that we all come across that don't add up right away if you're reading carefully. Things that maybe you haven't studied yet, uh, ideas that you maybe thought you understood, but now you realize, I don't actually understand that very well. And things that really maybe cut against the grain of your present or current understanding or expectation about God. And when we come to those moments, because it happens fairly frequently, when we come to those places, here's what I want to encourage you, encourage us about today, is that these are not places to be avoided. When you come up against a question that you don't understand, don't avoid it. Don't imagine someone out there knows an answer, and that's good enough for me. I want to encourage you to engage in those places, to study, to pursue, to lean into. And the question is why? And the answer is because those places are almost always the turning point to knowing God in a new way. Isn't that true? We learn new things about God. Has anybody exhausted their knowledge of God? Okay. And not even, not, not even the, the old people. <laughs> They're, 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 even, even you, <laughs> perennials, yeah, that's right. <laughs> oh, that's good. Now, the reason is, is that when you understand something new about God, the one motivation is that that can change our lives, right? If we have new information, new insight into the character and the nature, the heart, the presence of God in our lives, the truth of God. But here's another reason why studying these places is important because of God's glory. Here's the, re here's the reality. God wants to, to be so glorious in our lives. He wants to fill our lives. And what we do when we learn new things is we expand our hearts. We open up new room for God to fill, new places for God to be more glorious and more beautiful within us. Amen? And so I want to encourage you this morning that our motivation for learning things about God isn't just that I learned something new so I feel better, I'm more comfortable, I'm more happy. It's actually a deeper purpose, which is I want to give God the most glory in my life. I want my life at the end of the day to be the most glorious for God. That is God's ultimate delight, is when he is glorified within us. Amen? Now, trouble passages, the passages we don't understand. I got one in my mind. You probably already knew that. Matthew 4, verse 1 is a prime example. You don't need to turn there. It's just one verse, but I'll, 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 I'll explain it. Right after Jesus is baptized, it has this puzzling little line. We've all probably read. It says this, Then Jesus was led by the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. I'm going to just say that again. Then... Jesus was led up by the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. And actually, we're going to read in Mark in a couple weeks. It says, Mark says, the Spirit drove him into the wilderness. All right. Does any, is anybody kind of a little bit shocked about that? Or a little bit, eh, what, do I really understand that? Have you ever read that and wondered Why? did the Spirit lead him into the wilderness? I didn't think God did that kind of stuff. I thought God wanted us out of the wilderness. Why, was he allow, why did he allow himself to then face the temptation of the devil? Why was it important and necessary? What was the purpose? Do you see how on the other side of that, there might be something new for us to learn? It's too specific a detail. Every gospel except for John, which doesn't have any story about temptations, Jesus' temptations in it, it's, it's in every single one, it's too repeated to be 
not important. And yet most of us probably aren't sure exactly why. Why Jesus under the influence of the Spirit? What was he really up to in the wilderness? What was his ultimate and eternal purpose in the story that it would serve God's plan in our lives? Okay, here's the question. So this morning, what if instead of being satisfied with, I'm not really sure, but I'm sure someone knows out there somewhere, and instead we investigated this together. And what if, and here's my what if, if understanding this could be the key to unlock how you think about your wilderness places? Does anybody have a wilderness place in your life? Your temptations. What if understanding it helps unlock your purpose and most importantly, your prayer in that place? I think it can be. I think we can understand it. And that's why I'm going to spend most of this time this morning not reading Matthew 4, but actually reading Psalm 57 because that's what my promise is about. My promise is that if we read and understand Psalm 57 together, we will never think about the wilderness the same way again. Amen? And if we do that, I promise you'll understand why the Holy Spirit led Jesus into it and what he might be doing in your life, in your wilderness, and why he might actually be leading you there. Amen? All right. Is everybody ready to read Psalm 57, find out what's there? All right. Here's what it says. Uh, Mine has a notation over the top. It says, to the choir master, according to, very vague here, do not destroy (laughs) a miktam of David when he fled from Saul in the cave. And this is what David says. He says, be merciful to me, O God, be merciful, for in you my soul takes refuge. In the shadow of your wings I will take refuge till the storms of destruction pass by. I cry out to God most high, to God who fulfills his purpose for me. He will send from heaven and save me. And he will put to shame him who tramples on me. God will send out his steadfast love and his faithfulness. My soul is in the midst of lions. I lie down amid fiery beasts. The children of man whose teeth are spears and arrows, whose tongues are sharp swords. Be exalted, O God, above the heavens. Let your glory be over all the earth. They set a net for my steps My soul was bowed down. They dug a pit in my way, but they have fallen into it themselves. Selah. My heart is steadfast, O God. My heart is steadfast. I will sing and make melody. Awake, my glory. Awake, O harp and lyre. I will awaken the dawn. I will give thanks to you, O Lord, among the peoples. I will sing praises to you among the nations. For your steadfast love is great to the heavens, your faithfulness to the clouds. Be exalted, O God, above the heavens. Let your glory be over all the earth. Amen? Amen? That's a, uh, it's, I, I got lost in this for a couple weeks. Uh, that's my second confession today. <laughs> All right, so what does Psalm 57 then have to do with the wilderness? What does it have to do with temptation? What does it have to do with purpose? And what does it have to do with prayer? Well, just about everything. It has everything to do with it. And we find that out immediately by reading the, the, the superscription above it. And it says three important things that I want us to understand. It says, first, to the choir master, so it, we already know it's a psalm, but it says, to... According to one, do not destroy. Two, it tells us it's a miktam of David. Of course, everybody's excited about that. Miktams, right? All right. No? Okay. Uh, Three, when he fled from Saul in the cave. So let's start with the most obvious of the three. This psalm is related to the story of David in the cave at En Gedi. That's found in 1 Samuel 24. And I encourage you... If you go this week, you want some great reading. Uh, 1 Samuel 20 all the way forward. David is in the wilderness, and he's, 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 he's running from Saul. And it's a, it's, there's some wild stories. And we remember, of course, that David was anointed 
king as a teenager, out of nowhere. Remember, Samuel anoints him with oil. But we know that he doesn't become king right away. He doesn't. It goes into a year, years of waiting. But things in that place are brutal for David. Because even though David marries into Saul's royal family, he marries his daughter, Saul the king is jealous of David and he tries to kill him multiple times. That's, you think your in-laws are bad, right? <laughs> yeah? Have they killed you yet? They're trying to? Okay. You're okay. And so David lives on the run for multiple years. And it goes from bad to worse for him when he's on the run. For David is forced first to flee from Saul's house, leaving his family behind. And it seems more heartbreaking to David to leave behind Jonathan, his best friend. And from there, he seeks refuge in a cave called Adullam. Uh, but there, things only get worse. So he decides to flee, of all places, to somewhere called Gath. Does everybody know where Gath is? Gath is in Philistine. Does anybody know who was from Philis Philistia? Goliath, right? And you know it's bad, so bad it makes running, David running to his enemies carrying the sword of Goliath seem like a good idea. He's like, I gotta go somewhere. He goes to the temple, he's like, do you guys have any weapons? Because I'm, I'm on the run. And the guy says, we only have the sword of Goliath that you, you, know, you killed him with. You chopped off his head. Take that one. Well, imagine showing up in Gath the place where, where, where he's from, with the sword of Goliath, pretending that you're just a nobody. I mean, it's a bad idea. So David is obviously, he's, he's got no options left. And that obviously doesn't end well. He has to flee from there. And he ends up, last ditch scenario, in this place called the Wilderness of En Gedi. And that's where this story is found. Taking refuge in its caves. And so, yes, this is a psalm all about David in his last place of hope, actually hopeless, in the wilderness, in a cave. And you can see that in verse 4, if you, if you read it. It says, My soul is in the midst of lions. I lie down amid fiery beasts. The children of men whose teeth and spears are like spears and arrows, whose tongues are sharp swords. He's surrounded and hunted, and he has nothing. Second, in the middle of the wilderness, we see this is also a story about temptation. Because in the story of 1 Samuel 24, when he's in the cave, it tells us Saul is on the hunt for David, and he's unsuccessful. He can't find him. He can't track him down until by accident, Saul goes to relieve himself in a cave. And it just so happens it's the very cave that David is camped out in. Imagine that, right? Now, I want to make a very important textual note is that you don't go to take a pee in a cave. Okay? So everybody understand what's happening? Saul, the royal king, is finding a quiet place to do his business. And you can see that in verse 1. David is there saying, he speaks about how he's waiting until the storm of Saul's destruction passes by. <laughs> and this is what he says. He says, you know, I imagine him saying, be gracious to me, O Lord, <laughs> right? He's got his nose plugged. He's not up a creek without a paddle. He's in a cave without an exit, right? And David is saying, you know, when he's in there, his men are whispering to him from behind, right? They're saying, look, David, do you recognize what moment you're in? Do you see what's happening? They say, this is the day. They literally say, this is the day the Lord spoke of about how he would give your enemy into your hands. They're trying to put prophetic significance. This is the moment. This is when everything turns in your life. This is the, the TSN turning point of, of, of the story of David. That you'll seize the kingdom. It'll come into your hands. They're saying, it's obvious. Like, can't you, can't you read the moment? Read the room, David? Your enemy is sitting there with his pants down, right? I don't know if that's where the phrase came from, but like that's literally Saul. He caught with his pants down. And I want us to hear the other sound of what they're really saying to David. They're saying, and tell me if this sounds familiar. If you are the son of God, because that was David's royal title. That's what son of God means, means king. If you are the son of God, if you are actually the one God anointed, then do what seems good to you. Does that sound like anybody else's voice? It sounds just like, the, just like Satan in the desert, doesn't it? If you are, 
if you're really. And so this psalm is a psalm about temptation. Do you see David's explanation? See his explanation in verse 2. David says this to his, his friends. He says, I cry out to the Most High in this moment, to God who fulfills his purpose for me. David is saying, others may choose what they want, but right now I hear what you guys are saying, but I am crying out to, the, to God Most High. And when he says God Most High, he doesn't mean I cry out to God who is most powerful. That's what, Most High doesn't mean most powerful. Most High means most important, most central, like the, 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 the unchanging one, the, the God of wisdom and insight. And so what David says is what I want so often is fleeting. What I think is right in my life so often in the midst of temptation, I don't see things rightly. And so what I'm appealing to is I'm saying, God, help me because I don't know what to do. This seems right to me, but I want your will and not my own. I want you, God, above everything else. So give me insight. And that flows right into his statement. He says, so I cry out to you, to you, God, most high, who fulfills his purpose for me. God, I want your purpose for me. Not my will, but yours. And I, I, that's a powerful prayer in the midst of temptation. Thirdly, we know this. It tells us it's not just about David's story in the cave, but something is happening in there, and that's why they calls it a miktam of David. Now, if you don't know, a miktam is a, a, a kind of psalm, a genre of psalm. And in Hebrew, that word means spoken with covered lips, like whispered. It, what it really is referring to is it's saying it's a reference to a, a secret kind of knowledge, something not known by most people, a divine revelation. And this miktam also then has a double meaning in the story because not only is this prayer whispered by David in, in the back of the cave, God, be gracious to me. Help me right now. Help me to know what to do. This is a prayer in the midst of his temptation. Help me to... to to, to do what's right, and I appeal to you, God Most High. He's not just whispering that. It's, he's, he's actually singing a song that carries within it a divine secret that God has whispered to David. God has shown David something in the wilderness that he's singing out now. So what divine secret has, David, has God whispered to David in the wilderness that, that he's employing in this moment of temptation? Well, remember, we've been told it's not just a miktam of David, but the first instruction, do you remember what it says? According to do not destroy. And so what that means is it's likely a reference to this is meant to be sung to the tune of or in reference to the idea of this tune, do not destroy. Do not destroy. And you'll find it other places in the Psalms. Actually, above and below, you'll hear this is a miktam to the tune of do not destroy. And what that means is that at that time, and we've lost the actual tune, so I can't sing it for you. But there was a well-known kind of song or a melody in that day named do not destroy. Kind of a daunting sounding song, right? That you would put different lyrics to. It was a melody. It was a song that you'd sing. And so we, we've had, we have obviously modern examples of that. The point was that it would be a melodic cue for when you sing together that they would know what kind of song it was. So is this, is Do Not Destroy a song of hope? Was it a song of thanksgiving? If it was a lament, you'll see they're all, they all share something in common. And the answer to what it means is found in Isaiah 65 verse 8 where we see it referred to explicitly even though the phrase exists in other places. And this is what it says in Isaiah 65. It says, Thus says the Lord, as the new wine is found in the cluster, and they say, Do not destroy it, for there is blessing in it, so I will do for my servant's sake and not destroy them all. Now, I'll ask you a question to explain. Has anybody ever bought grapes? Right? You go and you, you get in the supermarket and you, you know, if you're very daring, I've seen people, they just pick and eat a grape. Right? I'm thinking, you can't do that, can you? Because I want to, right? You go and I cut it through the bag. You give them a little squeeze to see if they're, if they're really crispy or not. 
But you ever get home and you pull out the bag and all of a sudden you're like, you looked at the bottom and you grabbed them in a rush and you're like, oh no, half of these, most of these are kind of gross, right? And you take it and if you're like in a rush, you just chuck them out, right? You throw out the whole thing. But if you're like me, you know the price of grapes. You saw the bill. It's like $15 for a bag. And so you go, I'm going to pick every single little good one off of there, right? What, what are you doing? You are not destroying everything for the sake of the whole, right? And that's, the, that's what this song that David is singing references. He's saying that there are times in our lives when everything looks bad. Places in our lives that everything seems unredeemable. Vast wildernesses that look dangerous to us and bleak. They may have happened to us or we may be in one right now. Maybe it's decades of difficulty. And you better believe how easy it is to imagine that the whole thing is rotten, right? That whole thing that happened to me, the whole thing I'm going through right now, this trial, this pain, Everything is broken. In times of hardship, loss, pain, and uncertainty, it feels like to us that the darkness will overshadow our lives now, that there is no safe place or refuge. Who's looked at something and said, there's, it's like it's, you hold it up like a bag of grapes and you go, there's nothing good in this, nothing good in this, and nowhere to rest. Quick look. All the grapes are rotten. And we just want to throw them out. We want to destroy them all. We want to forget it. We want to have it be over with. But our lyrics are, our lyrics in our lives are, I want to be anywhere else but here. Has anybody said that? I just want to, I want to be somewhere else. That whole season of my life was death and destruction. I just want to move past it. Well, I want you to know, David can relate to you. <laughs> and he was fully justified in saying that about his situation in that moment. Everything about this is brutal. There is no hope. This is going to be the end of my life. The wilderness of En Gedi was a harsh wasteland. It was a place of last resort. You didn't vacation. It wasn't like, where would you like to go? Portugal to the coast or to the wilderness of En Gedi? Oh, the wilderness. I've done the coast. Let's do the wilderness. No one's saying that. It was a place, not where you dream, but it's the place where dreams go to die. It was cold, it's unforgiving, and it was brutal. And yet, understand this. In the quiet isolation of the wilderness, David began to hear God's miktim. God's whispering, humming, a secret tune to the melody that was long forgotten. God started singing that, the melody of do not destroy for there is blessing here. He began to say that, David, don't throw this out. Do not waste your wilderness. There is something happening here. Do not be afraid. Eugene Peterson said it this way. He said, David started out running for his life, but at some point he found the life that he was running for. And the name of that life was God is my refuge. That's what he found in the wilderness. See, the wilderness is the place all of us are brought to learn that God is our refuge. God wants to put that secret right in the center of our hearts. That God is a refuge, an ever-present help in times of trial and trouble. It is the work of the Spirit. Because he desires, this is what God is hoping for us, is that in the wilderness we will find true rest. Because there, there's no rest anywhere else, right? Because he desires us to find real peace. Because as David said in verse 1, it's a place we can actually anticipate God being merciful and gracious to us. Rick Warren expressed the purpose of the wilderness pretty succinctly when he said, you will never know God is all you need until God is all you have. Amen? And we were, we were singing kind of that wilderness song this morning, right? Sing a little louder. 
in the presence of our enemies. We're singing a little louder. There's a song that we're singing. So know this. God does not lead us into the wilderness so we can starve. Picture Israel. He leads us so we can be fed from heaven. Amen? He doesn't lead us into the wilderness so that we can die of thirst, but so that we can drink living water from the rock. He doesn't lead us into the wilderness so we can get stuck walking in circles, but so that we can learn to walk in complete and utter dependence on God. See, the secret of the wilderness in our lives is that it's not a punishment. The wilderness is to explode and explore the glory, to expose the glory of God within us so that we might burst with joy as we rest in him amidst a wilderness of nothing. And so we can learn to access the great storehouse of God's grace for our lives and so that we can give it and share it with others who need to learn how to rest as well. God is our refuge this morning. God is your refuge. And he wants you to know that in the middle of the trial. That's why you might actually be where you are. There's an anecdote from uh, Native American tribes that illustrates uh, this lesson. And this is, the story goes that upon reaching the age of, of manhood, probably 12 or 13, every boy in, 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 a, in the tribe would be taken away, stolen away by the tribal leaders, right? Led in procession out into the middle of the night, blindfolded and taken deep into the dense, densest bush, And they would be told to sit there blindfolded as they would hear the sound of the elders leaving them and returning home. And they were just there in the middle, in the wilderness. In the darkness, they would sit there. The night, every sound is frightening, is amplified. You know how that is when it's dark out, when you're half asleep and you wake up and you hear that sound in the night? Everything's amplified. Right? All of a sudden, it's, of course, it's an axe murderer has broken in, right? It's just the fridge. But, you know. <laughs> and imagine how vulnerable you might feel, unable to see, just to listen. And you have to sit there all until the sun would break. You'd feel the warmth of it on your face. And they would then be allowed to remove their blindfold only to find that their father has been sitting directly across from them the entire night keeping watch. And that's the secret that David learned in the wilderness. He learned, God is here and he is my refuge. God is the only one. There is no other place, but God will be my refuge. Now, how this unfolds is wild. And we know that he understood this because of what he does next in the story. Because instead of striking Saul down, instead of pulling out his sword and just ending it, he, instead of taking matters into his own hands, what does he do? Does that, do people know? Do you guys know? He cuts off the corner, the hem of the royal robe that Saul had probably taken off. And that's quite significant in Psalm 57, for this reason, because the word for the corner of the garment or the hem of the garment and the word for wing are exactly the same in Hebrew. They're the same word. And so do you see what David... So so in the story, Saul leaves the cave unknowing, doesn't know David's there. And David, as, as he's a little bit far off, David comes out of the cave and holds up the hem and begins to speak to Saul, saying, Saul, do you see, I don't have any ill intent towards you. I'm innocent of the charges. I don't want to kill you. I could have, and I didn't. And this is what David is saying as he stands before Saul. He holds up the wing of Saul's garment. And he said, everyone told me I could finally find, find refuge. I could make my own refuge. I could, I could create safety in my life. I could, I could walk into the palace tomorrow by taking things into my own, hand, my own hands. They said, the only way you'll secure your future is to kill Saul. The only way to exit, listen to this, the only way to exit the wilderness is, becoming, is by becoming wild yourself, by stooping down to Saul's level. In the wilderness, we are tempted 
to become wild, to do things that we shouldn't do, to make compromises, to believe things, to look for shortcuts, to get out early, to, to exit on our own strength. But he stands up and he holds up the hem and he says, I have learned the secret of the wilderness, O Saul. I have found my only real refuge is not under the shadow or the, the shadow of your hem or your garment or my own will or ways, but under the shadow of his wings. Only under the co- corner of your garment, O Lord, will I ever find my refuge. See, if God is your only ref- is, <laughs> see, when God is not your refuge, you will always fight against the wilderness. You'll always do battle with it. You will always fight against people. And you will even learn to justify evil when you don't know this. If you don't learn the wilderness lesson, you will always act on your own. And you will live apart from a deep and abiding trust and rest. You'll always be frantic. You'll always be afraid. But when God is your refuge... The darkness does not define you. David was not alone in that cave, was he? Was he abandoned? All of his friends said, there's nothing here. This is it. We're scared. We're we're alone. And David says, no, no, no. God is my refuge. When God is your refuge, you keep your peace and you can stand steadfast. Your trust is refined and you find your salvation. I'll say it again, don't waste your wilderness this morning. This morning, would you let God be your refuge? Because when you do, when you do, your prayer is transformed. This is what will happen. You pray differently. Actually, you pray like Jesus. Only because God was his refuge could David pray the words. And it's repeated twice, almost kind of like the chorus of the song. And this is the chorus. You can see it. Um, in verse 5 and verse 11. I'll read it. Both places it says, Be exalted, O God, above the heavens. Let your glory be over the earth. Over all the earth. So what is David praying there? He's saying, in this moment, I am not a victim. I am actually commissioned by God to be a conduit of his purpose and his will. I'm praying. I've got something more powerful inside of me. I've got a prayer because I'm not here. I'm here on purpose. I'm not a victim of the wilderness. I'm here because God put me here. And every place God puts me, God has a purpose for me. It doesn't matter if it's in darkness. We have purpose. Amen? Do you realize that? Every commentator said this is the Old Testament version of a prayer you may have heard of. Where Jesus prays, our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be your name. That's, it, many think that this is actually kind of the inspiration for that part of the Lord's Prayer, this cry of David in Psalm 57. Be exalted, O God, above the heavens. It's the Hebrew version. Be exalted, be, be hallowed, O God. And then he says, let your glory, let your kingdom, let your purpose fill the earth through me. Your kingdom come. Your will be done on earth here as it is in heaven. That's the prayer of the saints. He was no longer a prisoner in the wilderness or a victim of his circumstance. He was a partner with God. And that's what Jesus was doing in the, in the desert, wasn't In the wilderness. He was a, learning to be a partner with God. This morning, what could change if we heard God singing the lyrics of our wilderness to a different tune? What if God was trying to show us what he showed David in the wilderness, that there is treasure buried in barren places, and that there's glory that, we'll never, that we will never uncover unless we enter into the darkness with faith? Because the glory is meant to flow through you. Let your glory fill the earth, Lord. Isn't that what God is doing, Jesus was doing on the cross? I want us to realize Jesus wasn't just dying for our sins on the cross, but he was showing us the hidden treasure of trusting God. That even though, think about it, Jesus had to actually die. He had to say, I will give up my life. I will, I will cease to breathe and be present. I will die. 
That takes trust. Even though the righteous may fall, he had to believe that God would lift him up. And that even though if they die, he will raise us up. That my struggle and trial do not make me a victim because God is my refuge and my redeemer. And this is, this is the cross. The cross teaches us about the wilderness. Is, is there a place too dark that we can't trust God? Is there a situation too difficult that we can't entrust ourselves to God? Is there something more brutal than the cross that we can't trust God? Look at the delight of verse 6 from the perspective of the cross. Imagine Jesus singing David's miktam to himself as he suffered, all to the tune of do not destroy. David says, they set a net for my steps. My soul was bowed down. They even, they even dug a cave or dug a pit in my way, but they themselves have fallen into it. But Jesus is singing from the cross, but my heart in the midst of this tribulation, look at verse 7. He says, my heart is steadfast, O God. He's on the cross and he's saying, my heart is steadfast. In fact, do you see what David begins to sing in the middle of the wilderness? He's not a victim of the, of the, of the situation. He begins to sing a victory song, kind of like we did this morning. He says, I will sing in the wilderness and I will make melody. I will sing a melody into the wilderness. Even though it's dark here, I'm going to sing a melody. I'm going to... I'm not going to wait for the light of the dawn so I can feel the sun on my face. I'm going to start singing right now, and I'm going to awaken the dawn. My faith will awaken the light, and I will bless you, Lord, for your steadfast love reaches to the heavens and your faithfulness to the clouds. This morning, can you hear it? The song of God singing each one of our stories. He's singing the song of redemption over us. He's whispering it to us. Now all of this brings us back to where we started. Because there is Jesus in the wilderness. And that's the question. If we understand Psalm 57, we can understand what he's doing. So let's just consider that for a moment then together. What was his purpose? What does the story reveal about God? Jesus being led by the Spirit into the wilderness. I think it reveals God's deep desire to redeem. To enter right into a moment of failure and fear and reimagine it. Isn't that what it means to live in Christ? I'll, I'll get there. It means, what does it mean to live in Christ? It means we give up, all of us here, if, you, if you've confessed Christ, what did you do? Galatians 2.20, right? It's no longer I who live, but it is Christ who lives within me, right? Lives in me. I have a new life. It's, it's not my old life. It's, it's, a new, it's a new life in Christ. And isn't that God's great desire to enter right into the place of sin and failure and fear and live a new life, reimagine it from within, rework, re reenact a life, relive our lives, no longer under, under the dominion of fear or shame, but through love. Who's heard, I mean, we've heard countless testimonies, haven't we? Of someone says, oh, we sang it this morning. I once was blind, but now I see. I once was lost, right, but now I'm found. We have testimonies of, in our own lives of, I used to be like this, but now I'm doing something completely different. It's completely different. And you have to realize, what is God doing? He's putting himself in the middle of the sin and failure and he's saying, I'm going to live a new life in Ian. I'm going to relive Ian's life according to the way I would live it. That's a beautiful thought, isn't it? How would God want to live your life? What would it be like if Jesus was living your life on the inside? And I want you to know, if there was a place in Israel's history that needed redeeming, it was the wilderness. See, all of us have places in our lives, even as Christians, where, man, that darkness, we look back and we say, that was the worst. I never want to go back. There's nothing about that that's good. And yet here is God living within us. And what does he do for Israel? Their story marked by failure. Years and years before, the wilderness had been filled. This is the Exodus. 
had been filled with thousands of Israelites on their way out of Egypt into the promised land. They, they were ready to go. But in that wilderness, rather than leaning on God, they took matters into their own hands, didn't they? And so they fought against one another. They got scared, didn't they? Isn't that what we said in the wilderness? If you don't trust God, you will fight against the wilderness. You will fight against other people, and you will justify doing evil. And that's what they did. They fought against one another, against the wilderness, and they justified evil. They worshiped false gods. Exodus then has a name for the wilderness. It actually says it's called the wilderness of sin. They just named it. That whole time in our life, that was the wilderness of sin. In that place, they failed to trust God, to believe in him, and listen to him. But here's Jesus. What does he do? He wants to rewrite the story. He wants it to be known that the path of the righteous, the path of the, perp- of the, pe- of the people of God is not to exit out of their sin and then fall into selfishness and fall into despair and hopelessness in the, in the desert, but to learn to trust God and then enter into the promised land and live victorious. Amen? Amen. And so Jesus is coming into this moment reenacting. He, does anybody remember? He went to Egypt after he was born, right? They, flew, they fled Herod. And they go to Egypt. Why? Because he's reenacting the story of Israel. They went into Egypt, and then he comes out. And how long is he in the wilderness for? For 40 days? Some, symbolic of the 40 years that Israel wandered? What's he doing? He's reenacting the story. He's reimagining it. He's reliving it, retelling the story, saying who you are in Christ, who you are as a son and a daughter, as a child of God, dearly loved, beloved, and called, that you have a future through the wilderness into the promised land. And so there he is in the wilderness singing like David, and he's awakening the dawn. He can't wait to tell the enemy who he is. He can't wait to tell Satan, listen, Man does not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. He's showing us who we really are. We are the children of God, and we do not need to fear, because God is our refuge. Amen? We are dearly loved by our Father, and he keeps us. His power and grace are more powerful than sin, and he will make all things new. He will restore every part of our lives. This morning, whatever darkness, defeat, sin, wilderness that you have in your life, the promise is that Jesus in you has a claim on that place. He wants to, to walk through it with you. He wants to rename it. What, that, that, what do we call it? We don't think about the wilderness that Jesus walked through and imagine it was full of sin. It's the wilderness. It was the, it was the launching pad for his ministry. In Luke, it says he, was, he left that place in the power of the Spirit. He walked into the temple and he says, the Spirit of the Lord is upon me because he's anointed me to preach the good news. Amen? He will be exalted in this life. His glory will be over the earth. Could you imagine he intends anything less for our lives?